Hi, everyone. Welcome to the joint uh, Heidelberg AI and uh, Data Science Seminar event uh, at DKFZ. And um, today we're going to, uh, we're excited to have Philip Mann here. Um, and he's going to tell us about uh, how to bring AI solutions to the patient. And I think that's a very um, interesting topic for um, this very researchy uh, Heidelberg environment that we usually have here. Um, because research uh, most of the time or many times ends at the publication. And so we're very excited today to hear about how this path uh, continues um, actually to create real life impact. And so Philip Mann did his PhD at the Heidelberg University for uh, MRI imaging for radiotherapy. And he's still working part time at DKFZ as a postdoc. So he has research experience, but he also helped this uh, AI um, using uh, Berlin-based startup with their product to really bring it into production. So he knows both sides, and that's why uh, we're very uh, interested in hearing what he has to say. So yeah, please welcome Philip. So hello, thanks. Paul, for this very nice introduction, I would start my screen sharing now. Okay, I hope you can see the start of the presentation. So, my as, as you already said, Paul, my um, name is Philip Mann. I'm working part time at the DKFZ and also for a company called Medier. And I just wanted to show you that developing algorithms is is a it's a, it's a nice thing and it's a very important to do, but uh, bringing it to the customer and to an application is a totally different story. So starting very shortly, short introduction of, of the company I'm working in. Uh, the company is called Medier, it was founded in 2018. Uh, the first prototype of the software we are distributing, MD Brain, was um, created in, in April 2018. And then, and that was the first um, big step and very important step, uh, the, CE, the CE mark uh, was then available roughly, yeah, like 10 months or nine months later. And then we had the launch of our, of our second product version um, another nine months later and are now on the third product version. So uh, bringing AI solutions to the patient. Uh, so you have an idea, you want to create an AI solution and you want to make it applicable in the clinical routine. The problem is it's not a direct way. It's not like one arrow that you need to address. There are like a couple of things you really need to take into account when you want to successfully launch a product that is then used, accepted and uh, supported in the clinical routine. So uh, those are one of or like the most important steps that, that we identified that needs to be solved uh, to have such a product in the clinical routine, starting with the medical needs, then developing the strategy, uh, how to how to like to analyze the customers, developing a marketing marketing strategy, in parallel and also at the beginning, surely uh, developing or choosing the right algorithms for the problems you want to solve. That topic that you widely, that all of you probably know pretty well, the data collection uh, problem that is for AI algorithms. So where do you get the data from? How do you feed your data into the algorithms then? <laughs> and especially for, uh, for a smaller, for a smaller uh, startup like we are, getting really, really good people is not that easy because the really good people uh, they get a lot of offers from big AI firms like Google or like Apple, and they have a salary that uh, we, as a smaller startup, it's hard to pay. So uh, then we have to find different ways of motivating uh, new employees joining joining our, our company. Then you have the interface between the algorithm and the final user. So it's the user experience process. Then uh, when this is all analyzed and when you have um, like, a, like a base that covers all the questions, then you have the, um, the product, like the minimal valuable product that is worth showing to the customers, that is worth testing with the customers. Then you have to approve the product. And for me coming from a physics department and like more a technical perspective, that part is really, really, yeah, it's a lot of work, a lot of documentary where you have to 
work together with a lot of uh, different institutions to get your uh, product certified. Then once this uh, is realized, you need evidence that your product is, is actually uh, giving a benefit, that the product is, 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 is working properly. And then you need to convince the users on one hand, and you need to convince the payers. So larger institutions, they, they usually don't only have the users. They've, they have different so-called stakeholders uh, that uh, are responsible for, one is responsible for distribution of products, one is responsible for um, for buying the product and so on. And this is not where it ends. It's basically a feedback loop where you continuously have to improve the product that you offer. So starting with the medical need. So uh, when you think about the following product, so you have an LP, there was a there was a need. People wanted to listen to music. So you had the LP player, so that worked. Then there was a second development, so they are like a, like a further update, basically, and that's the CD, the compact disc. So everybody still uses it. It gets least, least or less and less important, but at the time it was launched, people used it and people still use it. So that worked. So when you think about uh, the, 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 the product itself, it became, it became smaller, it became more handy, and the storage increased for each, let's say, product version. So it was an obvious thing to develop the mini disc. I don't know who of you had a mini disc player. I was 100% sure that this is the way to go, that mini disc is the most practical thing and that it's really valuable to have such a thing. But at the end, it turned out it did not work at all. So I think in 2011, they stopped the development of the mini disc and people really did not buy it. It was not a success story. What is the reason? People were not thinking, or one of the reasons is people were not thinking out of the box. So they were continuously thinking, okay, it's better to have like a smaller product with more storage. But then there was the MP3 player coming. And what the MP3 player offered was it was small, it was way more practical to get to get the music, uh, to get the music into into the device, uh, into the device you're using. And it became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So here, the idea was, on one hand, was what's okay to think that a smaller, uh, smaller disk or smaller device uh, is worth developing. But at the end, the parallel development of the MP3 player kind of uh, managed to make the mini disk development stop. So what you always have to do at the beginning: make sure that um, you develop a problem that is worth solve uh, that you develop product that is worth being solved by, by a software. So what we did um, at the first step, we evaluated, so, so we had a lot of background in MRI imaging, and we saw that uh, the amount of images being, being, um, being acquired uh, through the years continuously increasing. And um, it turned out that the data volume exponentially grows while the ability to analyze such data uh, which is usually done by the radiologist is continuous, like it's, it's not increasing that fast. So this kind of information gap is potentially um, a way or like a like 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 a hooking point to to develop a product that can close that gap. And this is what people did. So for example, we have uh, another company it's called Zebra Medical Vision. What they do, they identify something on images of like flagging images where uh, the, the image data um, that is acquired uh, is, 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 is differing from, like, from a, like from a standard patient. So flagging that there might be something wrong, helping the radiologist to focus on the really important stuff. Then there's another, an, another company that's focusing on um, segmentation of stroke and uh, perfusion imaging. That is uh, that that increases better decision making before um, surgical interventions. The product we developed, or the product we 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 um, we are offering, uh, it's it's focusing on um, multiple sclerosis and helping radiologists to um, improve their efficiency. You can basically say that uh, the the MS diagnostics. Uh, is based on MR imaging, and on these images you see like small, small white dots, and that need to be counted. 
uh, that need to be located. So in what kind of area of the brain are they located? And uh, they also need to be volumetrized, meaning that the, the size of these little dots also needs to be um, evaluated, especially in the longitudinal uh, evaluation. So if you have an evaluation on one time point, and then, I don't know, like six months later, you have another evaluation or another MRI imaging, and then you compare those and then you can see how these, uh, how, how the, um, how the MS progresses. So medical need is identified, improving the workflows, uh, making diagnostics more reliable, then you need to develop a, a strategy. So what do you need to take into account? So first of all, uh, you need to make sure that there's a medical need. This is what we already had. Then uh, you need to find out the potential impact of your solution. So what does your, uh, your, your solution impact have on a, like on a medical or in the financial field for, this, for, for the specific customers you're addressing? Then defining or having the first idea of the minimal, minimal valuable product, the, MV, the MVP with the, net, with the essential features, then the resources you need, you need to collect them, then data sourcing strategy needs to be developed. Where do you get this data from? Uh, scientific versus commercial product. Do you want to offer it more in a scientific way or do you really want to make it a scalable product that needs regulatory approval? Uh, market sizing, market targeting. Even if you have a product that is perfectly developed and um, addresses a special need, if the, the market size is really, really small, or the people you are targeting don't see the value in, the, in this product, that doesn't really, um, that doesn't really uh, yeah, help you with selling the product. So uh, who is the potential customer? And then the financing strategy to finally develop a business plan that is then being presented. As a next step, you need to um, find the correct algorithms. So you are the expert in this and machine learning. I'm not really an expert in that. I know a little bit about this, um, but uh, you need a team that knows which kind of um, which kind of problems that need to be solved, which kind of machine learning algorithms you use. And for our case, which is basically the detection and the quantification. Uh, of, of imaging attributes, uh, we, we chose a, a convolutional network-like unit architecture. And if you have questions or more specific questions on that, um, my colleague Thomas uh, will be available for questions after the presentation regarding this. So uh, the next point, once you um, acquire the algorithms, you need to make sure that you have a data collection. So where do you get the data from and um, what kind of data you have? Annotated versus non-annotated data. What is the level of annotation? You could have a radiologist that is a senior on the senior level that does the annotation for you. You have a, um, you have a, a, a radiologist still in training, so the quality of these annotations differ. So you make sure that you get the best out of that what you have and how much data you need to have an algorithm that is we're working in the environment uh, you are placing that algorithm in. And this is, this is really, really an important point because um, what I know from research, you, you have or you develop something that perfectly works well in this environment, you are, uh, you, you are testing your algorithm. But when you want to scale it, if you have different people that use your algorithm, if you have different images that are being created, that, that gives an entire another level to the quality of the algorithms you are developing because you have to handle a lot of different kind of data sets and the different, different um, images. So the potential sources, uh, what we did, we uh, generated them by our own. We generated them together with our customers. So this is uh, that it turned out to be to be to be a nice way to get annotated data um, that that you also integrate the customer into your um, data source uh, acquisition process and also by scientific collaborations you can um, acquire some data or you get data by sources from commercial providers people and talents. Uh, 
I, yeah, I, I shall be to told you about this. If you have all these huge companies that, uh, that want to acquire the best of the best of the best talents in the field of, of, of um, artificial intelligence, um, they, they have a lot of resources available and they have a lot of power to convince people to join them. So as a, as a, as a smaller startup, you have to, you have to, um, to give uh, the talents another way of identifying with, with your company that they, that they are motivated to join you. So what we basically did, we, we give them a lot of responsibility at the very beginning and a lot of flexibility um, that they basically can work kind of as like they used to work before in the research environment. But this is, this is, uh, yeah, this, this is a very, very, very important, important point that you have to be aware of once you uh, decide probably maybe to, to start um, your own startup, that you need to make sure that you have people that uh, do the work that are well educated to solve the problems you want to address with the product. So, and then uh, <laughs> um, a topic that is, I mean, it's not mostly ignored, but um, people tend to not focus that much on, on that part on the user experience progress process. So this is, I, I mean, that's, that's a really nice visualization uh, of, yeah, of, of, of what kind of problems uh, you can face if you, if you are not uh, focusing that much on the user experience. So uh, on one hand, you have the user that, that, that wants to show you the, 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 how, how he thinks uh, an interaction with your, with your software is perfectly. Then you have the product leader who maybe understands it in a different way as it is displayed here. Then you uh, have a designer, then you have uh, the programmer who worked on the product. And then at the, or not at the end, but in a in between step, you have the business consultant that is how, who, who basically sells um, and, and, and describes the product that is wanted by the customer. Then you have on one hand, you have uh, the, the cost of the, the development. And at the end, um, it maybe turns out that the customer really did, did want to have something completely different. So um, what, what I want to say with this is, it is extremely important to continuously make sure that uh, the product, how it is being developed and the product, how, it, how the interface between the, the user and the algorithm itself, that, that you make sure that you continuously get feedback if you are on the right track. Because if you have different people that are responsible for, 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 for making the product happen, um, you, you can end up with completely different things if you're not making sure that uh, you have a very sufficient and efficient uh, feedback loop. Also, the usability. You could have, for example, here you could develop matches, um, but if you're not making sure that uh, you have enough space for, for, for the fire to not uh, hit your fingers, then it's a product that basically solves the purpose because it uh, creates fire. But uh, at the end, no one uses it because it's, I mean, you don't want to burn your hands. Or uh, like this, if you, if, if, yeah, that's, that's, that's a kind of st stupid example. Um, it's often not a bad idea to limit the amount of choices you have. So giving a huge degree of flexibility to, to the user sometimes is also frustrating. So making sure that only the relevant choices are being made by the users. Because the user, uh, the UX design, and the user interface—that's uh, that's basically the bridge between between the user and the product, and it needs to be perfectly designed to make sure that the user wants to continuously use the product. So what we had at the beginning it was a very, yeah, let's say a very basic sketch of uh, what 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 we developed of the product, and the second version was a little. A little bit more, um, yeah, a uh, little more details, better visualization, also in combination with the direct interaction of uh, the the algorithm itself, and then in the third version, a two pager where we continuously integrated the feedback of our customers. For example, 
what we what we didn't have on the screen is uh, that most radiologists they, they they do the diagnosis and they are um, they, they report in a dark environment. So if they switch to a like like to brighter interaction platform, what we had here, um, it kind of interrupts their flow. So the so switching from a from a from a bright environment here to the dark mode of um, our, our our user experience platform that created a huge benefit for them. They were really really happy with that, and it was just like switching colors, and that inc significantly increased the, uh, the 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 user satisfaction. But to know this and to get these uh, information, you need somehow to continuously question your product and also to 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 get feedback from the customer so here there was like a like a um, like a re regular survey we 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 perform where uh, we get input of all the the functionality uh, the algorithm currently has how well it works what they want to have improved how it is integrated in the daily routine and so on and based on this feedback you could um, basically continuously uh, improve the product you are designing. So the minimal value of a product, which is uh, yeah, which will then based on the previous uh, on the previous findings and be developed, it doesn't make sense to um, create a product that is completely finished uh, or or which has a basic functionality first at the end. So if you have, if you want to create a car, it doesn't make sense to provide the customer uh, wheels. And it doesn't also make sense to have like two wheels or four wheels if there's no engine in it. So what you basically do is you start from, from, a, from, from a really easy product that the customer already can use and it might not 100% happy with, but um, it gives him an idea of what the product can do and he continuously sees a progress. So he will be continuously dissatisfied. And the good thing is um, you're giving the customer the chance to shape the product. So here in that case, and the upper case, you were probably thinking that the customer at the end wants to have a, wants to have a regular car with a top roof, but um, in the end, maybe he doesn't want to have a, like a like a regular car, he wants to have a convertible um, where he can enjoy the sun. And this is only possible when you do a stepwise product, stepwise product development. So I think this is a really nice example. Uh, what you what you see here, so it's a it's an onion sorting machine. It does what it should do. It sorts the onions. It's probably not the most um, like like the most advanced technique, but it serves the purpose. So that when you see that customers are happy with that, you can finally end up like with a professional uh, onion sorting online so the uh, onion sorting machine, like like this one here. So uh, start with the minimum uh, and develop close to the customer. And for that, you need to have a good user experience, uh, experience and a market research strategy. Because if you develop something that nobody wants to have, nobody wants to buy it. And uh, yeah, the little bit drawback for medical products is that um, the product development itself starts with the documentation, um, yeah, like, like with a thorough documentation right from the very beginning. Because in a medical environment, you uh, need to have an approved product to being able to sail it or, or to, to scale it um, throughout the, the um, yeah, throughout your customers. So and the approving process itself, I will not go much deep into that. I'll just give you a rough overview. It took us around nine months to do that. And we were working closely together with companies that were specialized in getting products um, certified in Europe so for, uh, for the CE mark. And this is an important step to be aware how much, A, how much work it is, B, it also costs a lot of money. And the earlier you start, 
um, to get all or like the earlier you start to to get information on how this certification pro process works, the better it is because if you want to have a perfectly working algorithm and then you want to certify it, this is uh, yeah, this is a lot of work because then you kind of uh, have the have the, the possibility that you basically have to start um, not all over again, but that you have to redesign your algorithm that is then conform uh, with the with the uh, yeah with the like with the approving authorities. And depending on what kind of um, product you have, the burdens for the certification differ. So uh, in our case, we are basically um, providing the the customer um, quantitative information that gives him additional input to do his diagnosis. So um, the medical product class is, I think it's still class one. But uh, once you are also um, providing info, or like w once you also uh, have a uh, like like a, like a diagnosis that you put on your or that your that your algorithm provides, that's a totally different risk class, and you have to be like you have to make sure that you that you are aware of what kind of algorithms you develop, so that you know in advance uh, how the approval process and uh, works and what is required for that. So then um, you have to approve products and surely you need to show evidence. In the best case, uh, you have already performed some publications of your basic, like of the algorithms you, 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 you previously approved. Um, and also make sure that you have publications throughout the, uh, like once your algorithm is sold, either with corporations, with other scientific collaborations, or also with with customers that that are motivated to uh, to show how how the daily how the daily routine changes through throughout using your product. What you should avoid is um, it's a it's it's a kind of a nice example in Germany. I don't know if, if you already know that, but there's a famous commercial where the where where uh, the Dr. Best uh, research team found out that the Dr. Best research. Uh, or that the, that the, the best toothbrush is the best toothbrush. So, providing uh, publications that are that is only based on your own data, meaning that uh, you you use your like that you use not publicly available data sets, where people can benchmark um, their own algorithms against your algorithms, and you only have internal research. That uh, that you that you show is is not the best way of uh, yeah of showing evidence in publications. So what you want to so what what you need to do is um, to identify what kind of questions you want to answer with the publication. So for example, one important question that came up at some point uh, with our algorithm is okay is our software really increasing the efficiency? This is definitely uh, worth executing, but you need to find partners, you need to have a good study design um, to finally show that. Uh, for that, you need the external partnering, and the best, or like, yeah, for, for that, you need the external partnering. Then sometimes people do publications by themselves using a product. That is, that is a good case because it's completely independent. And then uh, sometimes people ask you also to to write reviews of your product or uh, yeah to, like, like to address more more general topics um, in, in, in white papers. And for that you need a publication plan. So uh, what kind of um, corporations you need to to solve or to to address these questions, and you need a discipline education. So at the very beginning, what what we basically did, we used publicly available data um, that we tested with our algorithm, and we benchmarked it with um, existing algorithms that are currently used in the in the um, research environment, which gives you a first impression on how well the algorithm works, um, and where um, maybe some yes yeah, some problems of the algorithm. So then. Um, this the the evidence the approved product the minimal viable product the user experience process 
this uh, this is basically the ground base to convince potential users of the product so uh what you need to do is you to convince users you need to focus on the core messages so basically providing them with an with a like like with the design of your unit architecture doesn't have the radiologist to 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 get the key messages or to convince them so and in our case, uh, the key messages are that it is really simple. It is basically integrated in the current workflow because from a personal experience, every radiologist who needs to, um, yeah, who needs to change his current workflow, this is a, like an additional barrier to, to use a product. It needs to be fast so uh, that he doesn't have to wait forever for the results and especially in Germany, it needs to be safe. So um, thinking about cloud computing and storing the data on, on the evil cloud is a completely no-go. So uh, this, this, this needs to be addressed um, and surely it needs to be somehow rewarding what you're offering. So those key messages, those key messages they, they work in our case, but surely depending on the product you're offering, um, there may be other key messages that uh, you need to find out um, to have um, to have a high probability that the customer or the, the user uh, finally uses the product. Then you need to have a, a multi-channel marketing strategy where you uh, use different marketing sources, where you use different marketing strategies to um, address your potential customers divided in inbound um, commercial, more or less, publications, LinkedIn, websites, or outbound, where you go outside and do some public, like do some work in congresses, or you have ads that you present, or you do an email marketing or, yeah, uh, cold calls that are not always uh, that fun, <laughs> to be honest, talking to radiologists. <laughs> and then you have your so-called um sales funnel where you start with a lot of uh with a lot of people like in the in the in the lead section then you have some some customers that are classified as qualified leads when they show first interest then uh, they go into the test phase where they test the product and then at the end you have the customer experience where you uh, also have to make sure that you continuously satisfy the needs of your product uh, of your customer and especially in AI, um, it turns out uh, that for a commercial application, it is extremely important to avoid the black box. You need to have a possibility to explain what you're doing. So the, the, the buzzword explainable AI, I'm pretty sure all of you have heard about it. And um, what our approach was is um, basically, basically this, you have from the workflow, you have your images that are being acquired and they are automatically sent to the, um, to our software tool, um, which generates reports that are provided to, uh, to the medical doctor. But then if he wants to check what uh, the software has done, there's an, like an, like, like an, like an internal, um, product structure where you could basically see what the algorithms did. So uh, in, in our case, uh, this, this segmentation of these, of these small white dots, like the MS lesions, he has the possibility to see the segmentation in a viewer. And um, if, he, if he doesn't agree with the segmentation, he can change the segmentation by removing or adding new substructures by one click or two clicks. And this, it actually um, turns out to be a nice tool because um, at the same time, he could provide us with these modified um, modified uh, calculations, only surely with the patient consent, but by this, we also have the possibility to acquire uh, annotated data that uh, is then fed back into the algorithms to continuously improve it. Yeah. So that was the convincing of the users, but uh, this is not, yeah, the, the hardest part, actually a really, really hard part is to convince the payers and to convince everyone who is part of the decision progress. So for this, you need to 
early, make sure that you um, that you know how how the decision or the command line basically is in this institution. So, for example, for small institutions, when they decide to to um, to develop or to integrate a new product uh, that is based on only two radiologists, uh, then for example, the initiator, the user, and uh, the decision maker, and the approver could be the same same person. Um, gatekeeper is someone who doesn't really want to have the product, or a gatekeeper is someone who, um, yeah, who basically interrupts the, prog uh, the decision progress or is an additional burden for you uh, to have an efficient um, uh, decision progress. Uh, and in larger, larger departments, for example, in larger research institutions or uh, university clinics, those can be completely different people. So you need to develop a strategy, a con a, like, a, like a convincing strategy for every player, for the initiator, for the user, for the decision maker, the approver, um, to make sure that in every sub step, everyone is convinced that um, the product gives them a benefit, the product is not, not an additional risk to data security, for example, here, like a very prominent gatekeeper in our case is, is, is the IT department. Um, since we are like our product um, is, uh, is basically installed on site, so we are not working with the cloud. Um, that results in the fact that the, their local IT needs to provide the hardware. The local IT needs to provide um, the, the operating system, and in our case, it's Ubuntu, what we are using. So some of them actually have never heard about Ubuntu. Some of them, they don't have a lot of experience, and then can take, really, they can take a while. They can sometimes take forever, up to half a year or even longer, um, to make sure that, that, that all these different players are, at the end, convinced of the product you're using. So my advice, uh, if you're planning on doing something, make sure that you know the processes. Make sure that you know how to uh, convince every player for every, for every single step. So um, plausibility check about the value proposition you have towards each, um, each user. You need to make sure that uh, the arguments you're providing is that, it, that, that, that with the product, it provides a solution to the problem. Um, it also saves time. That's what the software does. It maybe also increases the revenue or the profit, depending on the software you are you are providing. And most most importantly, it generates positive emotions for most of the players that are part of that. So once you went through this, um, once you went through this process, once you don't stop. What you need is an effective feedback loop that you continuously improve all the different sub-steps that, that, that I was just presenting you. So going back, for example, to our first minimal viable product. So once you went all, uh, once you went through all these different points, um, at some point your customers might say, okay, we really need another feature. So you don't only have the small onions, you need the big onions. Then you need to evaluate, okay, do I need new developers? Do I need to rethink the entire product or is it just an extension of the old product? What does um, the extension have an influence on the stability of the product? Uh, do we really need this? So is it only one customer or are there only 10 or 100 customers that need that? So this needs to be evaluated then if you have, um, if you have this input. Or, the customer sometimes uh, is not quite sure if he's using the product the right way. So sure, in that case, that, that doesn't work. So it's a matter of customer education, continuous customer feedback, making sure that everything works properly. Or sometimes you also have these kind of customers that, uh, that, are, that are complaining that the product isn't working, but at the end it turns out they're using it for a completely for a completely different purpose that it's not intended to. And to make sure that every 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 customer or that, that every user at the end is happy with the product, um, you need to continuously evaluate that. So uh, for example, you can do that by customer surveys. 
you can um, acquire usage, usage statistics. So how often do, you, do they use the product? Is there at some point a decrease in the usage of the product? Um, having an automatic failure reporting is really important that you can proactively um, uh, do modifications on, on the product before actual, uh, before the customer maybe realizes that uh, something went wrong by, for example, continuous update. Um, where like is, is, is the product working itself? Uh, having or generating, generating new, new image data for example, to, to increase your, to increase the quality of the product. So at the end, um, it is, it is really important that when you want to integrate such a product, uh, in, in like, like commercially integrate such a product, it's always an iterative process where you need to have extensive feedback loops to develop a good product. Um, personal advice, especially in the field of AI, uh, avoid the black box. Make sure that um, the, the human, like, like there's a human machine interface on which extent uh, that, that, that is happening um, that depends on the application. But just providing them with a, like, w like with one number or providing them with a suggestion what they will do is at least in my opinion and at the current state is not sufficient. And um, to make your product available or to, to make sure that the product will, will have an, yeah, like, an, like, a, like a large, broad range of applications or like a, like a broad range of users throughout um, different institutions, you need a right strategy um, and a multi-channel uh, communication strategy to make sure that uh, people, yeah, know the product, know the product well, and see the benefit of that. So with this, I think I was quite in time. I hope um, you could get a rough overview on uh, what it means to get a product from a first idea or from a first algorithm to a, to a final commercial product. And I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Philip. First, I want to hand over to Lina to address her questions directly to Philip. Thanks again for your talk. Yeah, so um, it's really great to see that some of the machine learning work now ends up in the clinics. Um, obviously, AI is quite new from a regulatory perspective. And I was wondering, with all your experience, um, what do you think should be changed maybe in the, in the German laws or where, you know, at a more broader level to facilitate bringing AI or let's say machine learning uh, to patients? Is this, you know, are there obstacles that you think are unnecessary in this domain? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not an expert on that, but uh, yeah, I have a, a, a quite a bit of experience. And like from a technical perspective, um, you're the expert in that, but the benefit of AI is a system that continuously learns. And especially when you think about radiologists, if you, uh, if you have 10 radiologists and they should diagnose a case, you have 11 different opinions. <laughs> so um, the personal tuning of the software to the need of the radiologist is, um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessary, but it's beneficial for a wide application. But the personal tuning of an algorithm would imply that the algorithm continuously learns or that the algorithm has a different structure depending on who is using it. And currently, this cannot be certified because then you would basically need a certification process for every single radiologist. And this is, in my opinion, something that needs to be addressed and a strategy needs to be developed on how to how to handle so, such situations because just rolling out one algorithm for everyone it's it's a good strategy but this is not where it should end it should go one step further that the algorithms like that the, that the benefit of ai also ends up at the customer side that it is yeah continuously learning yeah. um based on the needs of the of the user 
Thanks. So yeah, so the dynamics, uh, I agree, that's an important topic. And I, I'm not sure if you will reply to this uh, question, uh, but I would be curious uh, if you can share some insights on how much money, say, in percentage of the whole budget, uh, typically need to res be reserved for the data plus annotation part, say, data and cu data curation. So in our part, we were quite lucky because um, we we have yeah like two radiologists, our founders. So uh, we basically get data for free in that case. Uh, we had uh, some yeah some good scientific collaborations where we where we got some data. So from our perspective, we didn't spend huge amounts of money to generate annotated data. And since um, we we also had this interaction between um, the like, oh, since we also provided the possibility to the customers to give us annotated data, um, it was easier for us to have access to this kind of data. So basically, what what they get is they give us uh, the annotated data, surely with the patient consent, and then they have to pay less for for the software. So uh, in our case, I don't know the numbers, but it's 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 not it's not a lot we spend. But surely, if you want to go on, on a larger scale and you want to have a lot of lot of data, then you need to spend more money. But yeah, this, that's not what we had. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you, Doreen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Lena, for the invitation. And yeah, I hope you you learned you learned something. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye bye. 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 bye.